Thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Mike Stringer. I'm a uh, red team and uh, consultant member from uh, Online Business Systems, probably one of the biggest global companies in security that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, we're based all over the United States, and this is my talk on License to Pwn, uh, how two Muppets infiltrated a Fortune 500 company in under six hours. So a uh, little background for this talk. Uh, this was actually my first attempt at a red team while also being the leader and like resident expert in red teaming for this company. So it's like talk about trying to build a plane while you're flying it. This, uh, this was the, uh, this was like my prototype trying to create red teaming and uh, the first actual engagement that we did in the wild with me and my, uh, my co-conspirator as we'll call him. And it turned out to be an amazing success and the purpose of this talk isn't really to show you anything novel or like explain uh, any crazy new exploits or super creative ways to do things, but rather to show how approachable red teaming actually is for someone who has never seen it, never done it, and uh, never thought that like it was something that they could even get involved in. So uh, hope you guys enjoy it and let's get started. So. Uh, this is, uh, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, like I said, my name is Mike Stringer, Principal Consultant and Offensive Security Services Expert for Online Business Systems. Uh, I lead the red teaming engagements and train my team as well as uh, am the SME for social engineering and network penetration testing, protocol analysis, and exploit development. So long-winded background <laughs> of everything that I do for this company. Um, I. Uh, I established this red team or uh, did this first service back in 2019, so this is quite some time ago now. Um, and uh, I've been doing, you know, hacking and playing with this stuff for a little over 12 years professionally now. Uh, I'm also a former Army vet, if that uh, is, you know, a little fun fact about myself. I'm a big gamer and uh, <laughs> I've often been caught saying client's gonna client as one of my. Uh, one of my favorite ways to describe how irritating some of them can be. <laughs> this is my co-conspirator, Josh Anderson. Uh, he is no longer with us, but he was instrumental in actually making this engagement happen, so I could not do this talk without giving him an honorable mention and telling you a little bit about him. Plus, you're gonna be seeing him on screen a few times. Uh, he is with Leviathan Security and has been a red teamer for a little over seven years now working in the security space. Um, he's a really big into car hacking, RFID, and uh, wireless hacking, and stuff like that. Uh, and he's also a speaker at Boulder B-Side, so if there's anybody from the Denver area, or if you like to go down there, um, he's, uh, that's where he's from, and uh, he's big into those spaces. Super chill dude, he made me say that. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's a good friend and just an all-around awesome security consultant that uh, if you get a chance to meet him, tell him that Mike said hi. This is the talk. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the deep end of red teaming. This is, uh, this, like I said, is uh, the first time that I actually went into a red teaming engagement and trying to do that for the first time while supposedly being in charge was possibly the most intimidating uh, task that I had laid upon myself for this job. So this talk is going to include all of the uh, costs, assumptions, embarrassing mistakes, glorious triumphs, hilarious stories, and lessons learned from my team's very first attempt at red teaming assessments, which uh, unfolded over the course of a year for one of our biggest clients. Uh, as you might have guessed from the title, they're in the Fortune 500, so this was a pretty intimidating client to be working with and really, really did not want to screw that up. The scariest part of this engagement for myself and my co-conspirator was that this was our first ever solo red teaming engagement. We'd never done physical red teaming. We'd never gone to the physical domain. We were just through and through pen testers. So we had always experimented and dreamed of it, but it wasn't something that we uh, intimately knew. The only things that we knew how to do really well was uh, pen testing, privilege escalation, phishing, and things of that nature. So. Uh, Possibly our biggest fear, and probably the fear of everybody else who uh, started in red teaming, was that you'd get caught instantaneously and the whole engagement would be a wash. And maybe this isn't a unique experience, and maybe it is, but uh, I created this talk despite how intimidating this engagement was for us. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're really proud of what we were able to achieve in that time. Uh, and, you know, just 
caveat, bear in mind that everything that you see in this talk is anonymized to an extent. So some of the pictures are from the real thing, some aren't, just, you know, uh, caveat, we got to protect our client's identity. So uh, quick high level overview, this talk is essentially going to be a brief 101 tutorial on red teaming. Uh, educating red teams that are just starting out or even uh, uh, groups that are thinking about implementing their own red team, uh, showing you what the budget and cost is of getting started, your essential needs, uh, and to make red teaming overall less intimidating. And hopefully we'll have some fun at the same time. So why do we red team? Um, the first thing that we have is our, our mission as red teamers. Uh, a lot of us would definitely say like drink all the beer, hack all the things, but uh, really what our mission here is to uh, uh, place the physical, technical, and operational controls of our client under its maximum stress load as far as we are able to provide. Essentially giving our client exposure to what it's like to be under assault by a state-sponsored threat actor, APT, something that is a serious threat to major corporations and see how they actually fare against a real threat in the wild. And the purpose of this is to help our clients with their security maturity and uh, give them a little bit of insight to how functional their security programs actually are, uh, as well as how it stacks up against somebody like me or like, you know, APT 5 2000 Infinity or whatever overseas. Uh, the goal of this is to compromise systems and data by any means necessary, and above all, main stealth. We don't want to get caught um, up until we struggle so much with getting caught that we're kind of scared, and we want to like throw our client a bone and say like, hey, you caught us three days later, um, which you'll see more of in just a second. And then the final thing is that we want to evolve as red teamers and uh, both for ourselves and for our clients because threats and defense are, like everybody says, a cat and mouse game where we're constantly trying to get one over on each other and that is what this is all about. We're trying to constantly get better at what we do because it's what the world needs for security to progress and because it's what we love. So this is the uh, red teaming one, two, threes. Uh, most people in here who have like even like read the overview of the OSCP exam guide or anything like that is probably familiar with the four-step methodology of reconnaissance, analysis and scanning, exploitation, and then uh, privilege escalation and persistence. These are the, uh, the steps in which you take in order to progress through any engagement. And this is like, you know, 101, the thing that you need to know how to do at least the, at the basic level uh, so that you are as prepared for your engagement as possible. Uh, reconnaissance, you know, is both passive and active to an extent. Passive being what you can find out without interacting with your target, and active being direct interaction with the target. So scanning, uh, whether it's like port scanning or service analysis, or just like calling them up and saying like, hey, tell me about your business, and things like that. So anything that touches your target, that's active. Anything that you can do on the OSINT side, that's passive. The analysis of determining what is actually a plausible attack scenario, finding where the weaknesses are, what the uh, use cases are, what potential there is to exploit something, and then actually executing that exploit is the third step, trying to gain access, get your foothold, and uh, penetrate the initial outer shell of your target. And then finally, to enact persistence, gain uh, a reliable method to maintain that connection or stay resident there. For most pen testers, this is very standardized and you know there's plenty of tools of how to do this. We could go on forever about how this is done in the real world. For the physical domain, however, this is a little bit more nuanced and you have to figure this out on the fly a lot of times because there's only so much you can find out in the physical domain from outside because you don't have eyes inside the organization to an extent. And uh, part of what you'll learn in this talk is that the biggest component of the success in this is how much of the recon you are able to do in order to set yourself up for success later on. When we started this engagement, we basically had nothing except like our hobby gear that we got because we love playing with this stuff. Between myself and Josh, our, uh, our gear was like, 
we, we had a few basic tools that we like to play with, but there are some essentials that you need in order to make this engagement a success. It varies how far you can go with certain things, but these are what I would consider the essentials to make this a success overall. So uh, a Raspberry Pi kit, which like you can get super cheap ones, but uh, this is like a fully contained kit, it will cost you around 100 to $120 ish. Uh, and the purpose of this is to act as a leave behind device because in the physical domain, you're only going to go this far as a uh, persistent threat if you can't get in by any other means. If you have to go to the physical domain, you don't want to stay there. You just want to get in, drop a shell, get the hell out. You don't want to expose yourself any longer than necessary. And we as a red team uh, want to simulate that exact threat. So a Raspberry Pi is literally all you need to be able to set something like this up. Second is uh, a way to uh, drop shells effectively. I can't think of a more effective or seamless way to do it in a matter of seconds than with a rubber duck or what I prefer is a Malduino. A Malduino is basically a rubber duck, but uh, the benefit of a Malduino is that it has a dip switch that you can select multiple payloads, so you can have one for Windows, for Mac, and you can have a variety of different shells for if you prefer Metasploit, Coatic, uh, don't crucify me, but PowerShell Empire, uh, and any number of any other C2 tools that you might be familiar with, you can have a payload on this thing for each one, and you can you know select it as you go. Um, also in the physical domain, something that's extremely helpful is a way to get through locked doors reliably. This won't work 100% of the time, but if you need to get out of difficult situations, a door shim is absolutely indispensable. The reason why, which you'll see soon, is that you can't always get into a place uh, with a door shim, but nine times out of 10, you can exit a building or get outside of a door as long as you're on the um, as long as you are on the side of the door that is uh, swinging out, you can exit the building. And because of fire code, that means that if you're stuck in a stairwell, uh, stuck in a, uh, in a man trap-ish scenario or like a foyer, you can always get back out even if the door is locked nine times out of 10. I can't say always, but um, this, this tool is extremely useful. And then uh, for more mature clients that have RFID and stuff like that, um, in this talk, uh, or this engagement, we used a Proxmark for RFID badge cloning and emulation. Um, but now that the Flipper Zero is a thing, like the Flipper Zero is not only cheaper and replaces the Proxmark 3, it actually also replaces the Malduino at the same time and a bunch of other tools if you buy the add-ons. So like, skip the Proxmark, the Flipper can do everything that you want. Uh, it's, it's an amazing tool and I absolutely love playing with it on a daily basis just just because it's so much fun plus cute dolphin animations. So the uh, next thing that you need as a red teamer is you have to set up command and control infrastructure, C2. Uh, command and control is a, any server or external host which is able to act as a centralized host for receiving connections from exploited hosts and systems in your uh, target environment. This, uh, there was actually just previously a, a awesome talk on living off the land with C2. There's a number of C2s you can use. Like I said, Metasploit is what I tend to go with, but there's tons and tons of these out there. Um, it's really dealer's choice which kind you prefer to use for your exploitation. And it's always evolving. So uh, every, every threat hunter knows that there's going to be a different type of malware that you're gonna have to face like every other weekend. Red teamers are doing that because it stops working. So not really any point in me focusing in on any one C2 as the best, but just understand that this is something you'll have to change as your service you know, grows and time goes on. Uh, you can also uh, consider a lot of infrastructure choices and options. Uh, I went with DigitalOcean in this case, but like anything where the provider doesn't ask too many questions that make you uncomfortable, uh, is a good choice. DigitalOcean worked for us. AWS is also pretty good. Uh, Rackspace, anything that gives you infrastructure as a service can work for this purpose. Um, and, you know, depending on what your team is familiar with, like anything can work here in this instance. Uh, and I, I did give some honorable mentions to uh, Metasploit Framework, PowerShell Empire, and Coatic. Like these, 
like I said, they're they're constantly going to be changing. So um, if <laughs> if if there's if you're looking for something new or if these are just becoming a hassle for you, you know, you can go on to any number of blogs out there in order to find something. Or if you have money like that, you can just get Cobalt Strike and you know one and done. Cobalt Strike is uh, I don't use it, but I I see the price tag and it kind of like just makes me faint on sight. But uh, it, it's it's known to be extremely effective, and they're constantly updating their payloads, so it's uh, able to evade antivirus reliably. Kind of breaking down the actual costs of this equipment, um, if you're like bare bones essentials is all that you can really afford, about $200 is what you should expect to spend between your C2 server monthly costs, um, a bad USB, whether that's the rubber duck or Malduino, door shims, Raspberry Pi kit, and then just some free software that you can get off of GitHub for actual exploitation purposes. And then uh, things that I find additionally helpful is a set of lock picks, uh, especially rakes, are exceptionally helpful in these instances. Uh, Flipper Zero, can't say enough good things about that. Uh, some Wi-Fi cards, a cheap clipboard, and a uh, little mini Wi-Fi keyboard to kind of help you with configuring your Pi, because I guarantee you that's going to take you longer than actually getting into the client site is making your Raspberry Pi work. So something to kind of like take the edge off as you're trying to get into that shell and just nothing wants to work. Um, and if you just have money burning a hole in your pocket, there's some other fun toys that you can get that also help but aren't necessarily required in order to make this kind of engagement a success. Uh, land turtles are awesome if you've heard of that. Cat sniffers, Uber tooths for hijacking Bluetooth keyboards and doing man in the middle keyboard injection stuff. That's all fun. And uh, one, one fun toy that we have was a badge printer that was also very useful for this particular engagement, but those are pretty expensive. Also not necessary, but very good for creating a convincing ID. Um, but if you're you know stuck in a pinch, I have, if you have like a badge ID holder, like a carrier. Uh, I was going to show one for demonstration, but I misplaced it somehow. Um, you can just literally slip a piece of paper with your face on it in front of the RFID card that you get as a blank, and that will work just fine. I have literally talked my way into more locations just because I couldn't get my badge printer working, and I'm like, screw it. I'm going to print it out at the hotel conference center, <laughs> and uh, I've gotten in many times that way. So let's actually move on to the methodology steps and how we actually start doing this. Um, by far, Google is perhaps the most helpful thing that you can have on your side when it comes to doing reconnaissance. Um, it's, it's indispensable and also very much required for getting this right. Like I said, your engagement is only going to be as successful as your preparedness as far as reconnaissance goes. Um, some essential things that you do need is do a little bit of groundwork with Google Satellite and Google uh, Street View. These are extraordinarily helpful because you can actually zoom in pretty good with these tools. Uh, thank you, Google Van, for driving past my client's site, like right up to the front door, so that I could see that it was covered in CCTV cameras and that I didn't even want to bother going in there because the front door, oddly enough, is closed completely and nobody's allowed to go in the front door. So it would have looked extremely weird trying to get in. Um, you can also rely heavily on social media, and I emphasize doing this because it, it can yield some amazing low-hanging fruit. Uh, LinkedIn, if you just go and befriend uh, or connect with people on LinkedIn, this gives you so much information into the company. People expose what services, software they use on LinkedIn. Plenty of the red teamers in the group will, will be aware of this, but you can get uh, you can also like scrape out the pages of uh, LinkedIn and make assumptions of what their email scheme is like and just get a full list of emails. And you'll find out social engineering is very important in this type of engagement, but we're just kind of glossing over that and focusing on the physical. But it's, it's definitely something to look into if you're not already doing it. And uh, while you are at it, make sure that you are identifying what kind of access your target is using for the, your physical domain, like if they have RFID badges, go onto their social media pages. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen somebody with a great big glowing badge on their front smiling as they're posing at a party. And it's hilarious because they've just given me 
the ID template that I need to just talk my way past a guard without having any access whatsoever. There's a list of uh, other helpful tools. Uh, Hunter.io is kind of like a, uh, a sales assistance tool. It's really just for collecting corporate emails and stuff. You can use this as well, but it also will tell you what the address scheme of the company is. So, and that's totally free. You don't have to pay for that tool. It'll just tell you like, oh, it looks like they use first name dot last name, and that's their email scheme at you know domain.com. And you can use that to churn out a list of emails and start going further with that however you see fit. Uh, and then scrapedin.py is a tool that uh, I created with, a, uh, with another former colleague. Uh, this is available on GitHub, uh, just at github.com slash scraped in slash scraped in, and uh, that, that's a pretty useful tool. Uh, we, we didn't put our names on it or anything, so, you know, this is just between us. I just don't want to get a bunch of angry phone calls from LinkedIn, like, stop scraping our website, it's whatever, man. Like, it, it's, if it's on the internet, it's free. <laughs> So, uh, and then of course Shodan. Shodan is just all around awesome Internet of Things analysis and mapping tool. If you don't have a key to it, it's 20 bucks, do it. It's, it's an amazing tool. It's, uh, it, there's no reason not to get this, even for your regular pen testing engagements. It's super useful. So now we move on to uh, the active part of the physical domain where you actually start casing the place, trying to figure out what level of access is necessary to get a foot in the door, so to speak, is uh, like the first part where your blood pressure starts to rise. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's, there's a few ways to do it right, um, a few ways to do it wrong, but I found out that there's, there's a lot of things that you can get away with, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but some things that you look for. You wanna be looking for hidden entrances, major points of entry are critical. And think about like, Watching the foot traffic of your target, finding out where people are going and how they are getting into the building is really important because, like I said earlier, the front door of this place was totally unused. Nobody used it. It was locked. There was no guard. It was just sh shut down. Nobody got to get in through the front door. Everybody parked in the back of the building and walked in from that side. Have we not been sitting there watching this place and like, why, where is everybody? We wouldn't have figured that out. Uh, and we would have tried to walk in the front door. That's actually would have probably given us away. Um, checking out where CCTV blind spots is also extremely helpful. Some have shielding, uh, but if it's like an obvious one, like you see on screen where it's like, you know where it's pointed, you can get a good idea of where there might be blind spots so you can sit somewhere and be comfortable while you an just analyze the physical domain of this place and kind of uh, watch the outer shell. <clears throat> and uh, while you're at it, if your former OSINT phase wasn't successful in like capturing pictures of badges, I have also had success just with a smartphone camera, taking a quick snapshot of somebody as they walked past me in the parking lot, you can get badges that way too. It's a little bit conspicuous, but you, you can get away with it if you're discreet. So the uh, next part of this was uh, figuring out our, uh, our other entrance. So I talked about the side entrance before. It was, it was you know, a cafeteria side type thing with an outdoor patio. The main entrance was security guarded. There was a person sitting behind a desk with access to cameras and everything. Uh, he had a badge log, which we didn't know at the time but he was watching people as they scanned their badges in to see that they were a legitimate person, popped up a picture of their face and everything. So it's, it was actually something that we didn't know was there. So we were gonna have to get creative on the fly once the guard realized we weren't on the list, so to speak. Um, and they also had a very good hard uh, visitor escort policy in place as well. So trying to talk our way past the front door was going to be difficult. So this is the side entrance that, uh, that we get a better look at from here. This is actually from the neighbor's parking lot. So the neighboring location was uh, just, uh, it, it was, it, it's funny, the neighbor's parking lot was closer to this door and the entire building than the actual employee parking lot. The employee parking lot was 150 feet away in the back behind the building and they're 
their neighbor was literally just 20 feet away from this side entrance cafeteria and like you could even see the glass windows of all the executives working uh, on the top floor which was I thought was pretty funny so it was easy enough for us to just go walk over there this is actually a Google Street View image uh, as a matter of fact you could uh, you could just go here and see there's there's some uh, garage doors which weren't always open but over there on the left uh, uh, there by the trees there's some uh, picnic tables and we noticed that like not many people were using them but we're like ooh there's a side entrance there that we can't see and you, you also can't see it in the picture but there's like some stairs that lead up here to the patio area there's another hidden entrance over there and uh, that, that was a second way in that we uh, were looking for uh, and uh, as you're doing this like you're kind of thinking up scenarios of like well what's plausible what can I do like if I go through the main entrance I'm gonna have to like tailgate somebody or I'm gonna have to talk my way past the guard that's gonna be difficult that's kind of scary over on the side it's not so scary to just like walk up and like pretend like you're having a cigarette or talking on the phone or something and just waiting for somebody to open the door and whoosh, slip right in and you can get into a lot of locations this way just by looking for unattended entrances that people come and go from as a matter of convenience. So while we were doing this, uh, we also were doing some Wi-Fi analysis uh, of the client. And you'd be surprised how many uh, engagements you can have some success on just by getting Wi-Fi access. It's why those Wi-Fi antennas are important. Uh, but it also is a difficult landscape if you're on the outside because sometimes you're really far away from the building. So we spent a great deal of time trying to figure out what this client's uh, wireless infrastructure was. Uh, we were kind of obvious, I would think, sitting there with a ton of antennas just poking out of the windows of our car while we just sat there on our laptops and employees are walking past us. I wish that I had requested some tinted windows because I was shaking in my shoes, expecting somebody to be like, yo, there's these two weird dudes sitting in the parking lot. They look like they're from Mission Impossible. What the hell is this? And I was just petrified that we were going to get busted. We sat in the parking lot with antennas sticking out of the windows for six hours. Nobody said a damn thing. <laughs> Anyway, onto the actual Wi-Fi attacks themselves. Um, while we were going through the wireless route, keep in mind that we've been doing work with this client for a long time, so we had some knowledge of their internal environment. Like we knew they were using WPA EAP for their authentication. We were probably not going to get in, so we didn't have to waste a whole lot of time. But we were doing reconnaissance at the same time, and you know we did it to say that we did it. But uh, uh, if if you're dealing with a truly mature environment where they require a red team, chances are Wi-Fi is going to be closed off to you. It's not going to be that easy. But you never know. So it's always worth giving it a shot. And also, you know, you want to at least uh, have the ability to, like, analyze who's coming and going. Because in some instances, even a good configured network, you can still grab some usernames and stuff like domain information just from EAP authentication. So just sniffing those packets by themselves is good information. It's worth doing. So don't, don't skip on it. It's, uh, it. it's worth it to do it. Um, and uh, like I was saying before, the, the, the distance from the parking lot to the building was a huge hurdle. It would have been extremely helpful for us to have directional antennas. These are about as cheap as regular omnidirectional, just like the big dongle antennas. Um, for 20 to $40, you can get a pretty high gain antenna and point it straight at the building. It definitely looks pretty weird having two Mickey Mouse ears in your windshields pointed at the building, but it, it helps a lot if you're dealing with distance. So know that if you're going to be dealing with uh, this kind of scenario in the future. So uh, RFID badge readers are also a big thing to think about because it's, it's way more complicated, we found out, than we thought it would be. Um, this was our, we had played with Proxmark and stuff by ourselves, but we didn't actually like realize how difficult it would be to figure out what kind of badges they were using. We were just like, oh, there's a bunch of universal types and we'll just like guess. As it happens, we got really lucky in that between the two of us, we both had the, uh, we had one of the cards that they used in their environment. So it was possible for us to clone badges. But it's, it's not always gonna be that easy. The, uh, the thing is, is that like now things are getting much more complicated with RFID. 
and uh, there, you could do a whole talk on getting RFID credentials to a building by itself, and that could take over an hour. Um, but some essential things that you want to do is do a little bit of reconnaissance and see if you can figure out like what they are using. If you have to, bring a mess of different types of IDs with you for all different types of MyFair Classic and HID prox cards, and just like get the most popular ones. They're cheap enough that you can get 10 card packages of these things, and at least you'll have a good chance of having something available. Um, thankfully, with the uh, new flipper, there's an excellent reader, uh, reader identification or detect reader function. You can walk up to a reader, hit it, and it will tell you the make and model version of the reader. That will tell you what the card is. Otherwise, you're going to have to either a guess or start like doing some serious hunting and analysis with binoculars to try and figure out what everybody else is using. Uh, oh, the other thing that uh, is really important here, even if you cannot clone a badge, I've actually found it's extremely useful to have a badge that doesn't work but still activates the reader. I have literally walked into a building with a, a piece of paper in grayscale, it was completely wrong because the hotel printer did not have color printing feature and the client's ID badges were color, but I did have an RFID card that matched their reader and because it beeped when I hit the door reader, the person was like, huh, that's weird. You should go up to this place and go get it fixed and let me in. So <laughs> having, a, having a card that actually beeps is hilariously enough for some people. So. Um, having something available, being able to detect that reader, it can help you along the way. So after we finished casing the joint and starting like kind of brainstorming how we were going to do this, uh, this, was, this was us that entire night. We stayed up all night till like three in the morning figuring out how the hell are we going to do this. Um, and we didn't do any of the C2 prep ahead of time, so like we were, we were seriously scrambling. Um, but as it happens, uh, Raspberry Pis and just a couple of uh, a couple of DigitalOcean servers is truly all you need. So, uh, in this case, we wanted to uh, set up our C2 infrastructure, make it so that we had every available means for us to get a shell back to us uh, before we even walked in the building, and be confident that it was going to work. Next, we had to print out our badges. We got some IDs uh, off of social media. We had a pretty good idea what their IDs looked like. Um, we needed to lay out the map of the building or have a rough idea of the schematic of what the inside was going to look like because we'd never been there before. And we wanted to have a good idea of where employees came and went. Planning our entrance and then rehearsing it because we didn't know what we were going to run into ahead of time. So Josh and I basically rehearsed like, you know, how, how are you going to talk your way past me? And I like, was the big, mean, uh, completely intolerant guard that was like refused any bullshit. And uh, Josh, Oh my God, the man is a smooth operator. I, I don't, he could have talked me into anything, I swear. But uh, he, he decided to be the, uh, the inside guy that was going to try and walk in the building first because I was all jitters. And uh, I confess to you, like even standing up here terrifies the absolute hell out of me. So Josh was the guy uh, to go inside because he was pretty confident by all means. So uh, he was like, yeah, I got this. So once we had uh, figured that out, we, uh, we kind of rehearsed a few scenarios of how we were going to get past, and we were ready to go. Uh, at the uh, end of it, like we'd never used the badge printer that we tried, and it literally took us three hours to make this badge printer work. I got it sucked. But uh, I, I was particularly proud of the fake IDs that we came up with, uh, and, uh, and, and especially our, our monikers. Um, I, I, I have worn the name Evanescence for a long time, Nobody has ever noticed. <laughs> so uh, for the C2 callback infrastructure, this part is really important, and you do want to think about this based on the target that you're dealing with. Uh, everybody's a little bit different. In our case, our client was like they were frequently had users going to uh, out to the internet. We needed to be sure, though, that we could get past any firewall rules and stuff like that. So having some backup options was really important. Our main one was OpenVPN, which we used for all of our pen testing engagements, and we had infrastructure for that, so that's a no-brainer. 
Um, the second one was reverse SSH connections and having that set up as like a cron job or a system CTL daemon that would run in the background and keep turning itself back on if it ever shut off or couldn't have a uh, decent connection. We wanted to have that in place. But then we were like, oh, crap. We have clients that filter both of these things. What is another option? And on the fly, we found a tool called Corkscrew, which is actually SSH tunneled over HTTP, which was absolutely the coolest thing, best idea I've ever heard of. And I literally have actually used this to get reverse shells in, in the wild from clients that refused all other traffic. Even though it's unencrypted traffic, it let the SSH traffic out because it was inside an HTTP protocol. That was really cool. So this was exceptionally useful. Um, so between all of these things, with reverse SSH being the most safe and reliable way to get a connection that was non-VPN related, um, and having a backup SSH tunneled through HTTPS, we felt pretty confident about how uh, this was going to go. Um, and I mean, SSH overall is just like high performance. It's a benign protocol. Everybody trusts it for the most part. So we were like, okay, cool. This this is this is good. We're pretty uh, we're pretty happy with this. If you absolutely need a tutorial on doing reverse shells over a, uh, SSH, there's a link here that you can refer to uh, at blog.stigok.com. Uh, this is just one that I pulled off of Google really quickly. Um, and it, it, it's a good working tutorial, but there's hundreds of these tutorials of how to do this out there. So, you know, Google it yourself. <laughs> the uh, uh, plan B that I talked about with uh, Corkscrew, this is the link to the GitHub repo for that. Um, this is available from Brian PKC slash Corkscrew, and uh, it highly, highly recommend this tool. It was exceptionally useful. The uh, most difficult part of getting this set up was baking in our own Linux daemon. So if you know how to do that, God bless you. System CTL is, I, I don't know what it is about configuration files, but they just fry my brain. So uh, like, yeah, after setting up all three of these avenues, we're like, okay, this is everything that we can do and we are gonna be dead tired tomorrow, so this is gonna have to be good enough. So uh, now was time to execute the heist. So the first plan that we decided to do was hard mode. We didn't wanna take the easy route in despite like all the indications that we were probably going to get caught um, but for whatever reason, we were like, no, let's, let's go double or nothing. We need to try to get in the legitimate way and try, and, and try to give the client uh, a chance. So we went with the tailgating approach through the main entrance, past the security guard with CCTV cameras, and although we didn't know it at the time, a badge log that was going to tell that guard, you aren't actually an employee. What's up with that? So, the, uh, but the reason why we did tailgating first is because it's reliable, it is easy for anybody to attempt, and it's the most likely way somebody's gonna get in, and also people are just friendly. So it's really easy to prey upon an individual to get in this way. So Josh was going to follow in somebody, gain access by uh, letting them open the door first, and then would attempt to break line of sight as fast as possible, get the hell away from the guard. It's kind of a logical trick where you forget about somebody faster proportional to the least amount of time you see them. Maybe that could have been worded better, but basically if you can, if you can enter someone's field division and disappear within 30 seconds, they have no idea who you are and they will forget about you completely for the rest of the day. They'll have no idea who you are. The longer you sit talking to that person, the more suspicious they'll get and the more committed to memory your face is to them. You don't want to give them a chance to let that happen. So breaking line of sight fast as soon as you get in is extremely important. So step one of actually getting in because we're going to encounter a guard. Confidence is everything. You want to look official. That's why I always carry a clipboard because nobody questions a guy walking around with a clipboard taking notes and staring at things inquisitively, like, hmm, that doesn't look right. And that's actually, surprisingly, intimidating enough that nobody asks you any questions. If you get stopped, 
you have several things that you are going to be expected to do that you will have to do, and you want to have these things prepared ahead of time. State your purpose, own your identity, whether it's a real one or a fake one, doesn't really matter. You, you have an identity, own it, have it down, and be confident in what you say. Have an excuse for why your ID doesn't work ahead of time. You don't want to try and make this up on the fly. You're going to bumble. You're going to be scared. You're going to be nervous. You, you will most likely mess it up if you aren't at least somewhat prepared for that eventuality. And then once you have delivered those demands from that guard or that person who is challenging your identity, create urgency in your situation and figure out a way to break line of sight and get away from them. So the first step for this, for Josh, was super simple. It worked immediately. He uh, followed in that woman that you saw in the picture before, walked straight in the door, like did a courtesy wave of his hand past the badge reader, nothing happened, and he walked right in. Guard immediately says, yo, your badge didn't scan and uh, I'm gonna need you to come over here. So as, uh, as soon as that happened, Josh is like, oh, okay, what's the problem? Comply immediately. Walks up and starts, uh, and starts talking to the guard. The guard says, I'm gonna need you to scan your badge again because it didn't read for some reason. He tries, nothing happens, nothing comes up, nothing works. So like I said, we luckily had a MyFair card, or I'm sorry, an HID Prox card that worked but we didn't have an identity linked to it. So it beeped, but nothing actually showed up. So as soon as this happened, uh, Josh realized I gotta fall back on plan B and I gotta come up with some kind of an excuse. Sorry, my notes are super tiny. All right, so thinking quickly, Josh immediately activated his fail-safe pan and he panicked immediately. <laughs> so, but, but only slightly. Just Panic just slightly. So whether it was real or feigned panic, Josh started throwing out excuses that like, oh no, I threw my card in the laundry last night. It went through the laundry with my pants. I probably broke my card. And just started like panicking to the guard and pleading with him like, I have a meeting I gotta get to in like five minutes ago. My boss is super pissed at me. What am I gonna do? Please let me go. And the guard's like, I, I really can't, you know, he's like, please, I'm, I'm in so much trouble, and just started begging with the guy. And he's like, finally, like, all right, but after this, go promise me you'll go down to facilities and, and go fix your badge. He's like, thank you so much, and bolted for the stairs. He went straight into the stairwell and disappeared instantly. That guard, by the way, gave us some interesting information. If you caught it, you'll, you'll hold on to that word for later, what the guard told Josh. Um, and that'll actually become relevant much later. So uh, wasting no time, uh, Josh broke line of sight. There's, there's other ways that you can play this um, scenario, by the way. Like I've, 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 my mentor many years ago who did red teaming like all the time, he talked his way into a building with a box of donuts. And he's like, hey guys, I got extra donuts here. Do you want some? Gave them to him. They're like, oh, you're awesome, man. Thank you so much. And then he's like, great, cool. See you later, bye. And just walked <laughs> off to the elevator. So there's, be creative, you know, there's, there's no 100% right or wrong way to do this, but just have something prepared and have a backup plan prepared, because you don't know what you're going to run into. The least that you have to figure out on the fly, the better. Uh, ooh, I am running out of time. Okay, so after that, Josh promptly got lost as soon as he went into the stairwell, because he found out that as soon as he walked in, the stairwell was locked, and it was RFID badge access out every single time. This is where he got stuck, because if he went back, he was gonna have to go past the guard, and then the guard was gonna be extra suspicious, because, oh yeah, that guy didn't have ID. It wasn't legitimate. He can't get through the doors, what's going on, and then the gears start turning. Not an option. Don't go back. Don't face the same person that just caught you, at least not for a while. Uh, the other option is to shim or pick the door. This was a fire escape door, so a little bit tough would have been pretty difficult to do. If he was on the other side of the door, much easier because, as I said, the door is swinging out. You can get out a lot easier than you can get in with a shim because you just jam it in there um, and pop the latch. But from the other side, it's a little bit more difficult. So the other option is to improvise, which is precisely what Josh did. So Josh, standing in the stairwell, flipped open his phone, 
and just started blah, 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 just talking about nothing and waited. Somebody eventually walked through the stairwell because luckily, you know, health culture was big at this company. They walked out the door and he's like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'll see you in the meeting and then just kept going. Person didn't even look twice at him and he was in. So as, uh, <clears throat> all right, there we go. Demonstrating effectiveness of the hall pass for bypassing locked doors. Well, well, I didn't expect that to start playing, but uh, this is a demonstration of the door shim of how it can work from the outside of the door. If and the door is swinging out, you can literally, there's no, uh, there's no door hem on the outside. So you can just stick the a credit card or a door shim in there and pop it open fairly easily. So if the door is swinging out at you like this, that's, that's the easiest way to get in. On the other side of the door, might be a little bit more difficult, but there's some uh, options for you. That's why I say the door shim is like the cheapest, easiest way to get through someplace uh, if you have to. All right, so uh, while still lost, Josh was wandering around in the building and the uh, first thing that he had to do was orient himself very quickly. So getting a fire evacuation map and figuring out where he was, getting into a secluded location and then chill out, plan your next move. Because number one, you're probably going to be absolutely panicking by the, uh, by the time this is all over. So that's one of the things that we do. Get into a restroom or something, hide, chill out. Um, there is a, uh, there is a uh, secondary entrance that uh, I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and play this for you. At this point, Josh was already in for some time doing some reconnaissance. So this is me going into the building, waiting for him to let me in. Um, but as it happens, that actually wasn't necessary. Just kind of tapping my badge and... Oh, hi, thank you so much. Some random guy just walked up to the door and saw I was having trouble and just let me in, didn't ask me any questions. So I, I ran into Josh later on uh, in the hallway and then we just like bolted to a hidden office that he found was unoccupied. Um, we also had some trouble getting in through the interior. So one of the things that we ended up needing to do was like get past RTE sensors, that's request to exit, which you can do with just some compressed air because the sensor just looks for a Think temperature differential and you can just spritz a little bit of compressed air through the door and suddenly it lets you in. It's surprisingly effective. So the last thing that we needed to do was to give ourselves a back door because this was absolutely essential for us. Once we got into the office, the number one thing that we needed to establish was persistence. So we're on to our final stage. I realize I'm getting short on time. I'll blow through the last slides as fast as possible. So when we plugged in our Raspberry Pi, we were relieved to find out that this was, it instantly worked. Not only one callback, but all three of them came back right away. So there we go, we established persistence, just simply going in behind a desk, unplugging a phone, and jamming a Pi in there. As soon as it turned on, we had shells, we had access, we were in the network. And if we wanted to, we could just leave it at that and walk away. But uh, we wanted to go a little bit further, so we tried the sensible thing every pen tester does when they get started is they turn on responder. <laughs> and uh, in about uh, 10 seconds, well, congratulations, you have domain admin and suddenly we're in the network. We've completely owned the domain. And we were disappointed to find that, oh God, that was already over. So this is a brief timeline. I'm just gonna kind of blow through this, but we got there, Josh walked in the building, just blubbered to the guard and said, oh, I'm gonna get fired and got let in the building. I met up with him through the side entrance separately, and uh, we plugged in a Pi, turned on responder, get shell, get DA, assessment done, right? Mm, well, I don't know. It doesn't feel quite like that's enough. So we decided to go the extra mile. We wanted to get into this thing. This was a biometric handprint reader with pin and a chip card reader to get into the data center. Uh, we really wanted to get in this room because we felt it would be like big time bragging rights. Um, so, you know, it, it, was, it was a situation where uh, we, we felt this was too easy. We wanted to give our clients their money's worth. So we actually spent 12 hours just hiding in the office, playing around, looking through file systems, just, you know, burning time until we saw everybody went home and then we got to walk around at night like a bunch of ninjas in the middle of the night through this corporate campus. And... Um, we found quite a lot of stuff. Like there was a bunch of unattended, unlocked file rooms with unlocked filing cabinets containing tax records and all kinds of fun stuff. I say fun, but like it's numbers. We don't really care, but the client cares. That's what matters. 
leaving behind more devices and you know other things of that nature. And of course, passwords on sticky notes. There were so many passwords. And I got so upset by it, like more upset than was justifiable. Um, but you know, it happens in every organization. Make sure that you're enforcing your clean desk policies, blue, uh, blue guys, you, like really, go, go smack some people on the wrist for this. Such password, much security. Uh. <laughs> the last thing that we found, and this is where I wrap up a little bit early, I apologize, uh, but we identified the badge room, which this was the crown jewel. We couldn't get anybody's badges this whole time. We didn't find any lying around, and we couldn't get close enough to proxmark their badges ourselves. So when we got to the uh, badge room, we were so stoked. I immediately broke out my lockpick tech. I'm like, I'm going to get us the hell in here, and we're going to go print ourselves some badges, and we're going to have keys to the kingdom forever. Um, within about five minutes of me trying to pick that lock, Josh uh, found these sitting in the desk right over there, five feet away. And uh, we're suddenly in. No lock picks necessary. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip the Proxmark demo just because it's a little bit lengthy. I don't have the time for it. But this, this was an exceptional tool. If you get the Flipper Zero, you don't need the Proxmark. Again, it works for 90% of cards nowadays. Um, but just lay it over the card, make it scan, and there you go. You have a discreet way to just go beep and walk through the door anytime you want. So I'll, I'll skip that, but like there, there's the there's the flipper, super super simple. And the prox mark's literally no different. But funny enough, we did that demonstration in the front door next to the security guard, and the security guard's staring at us like, "The hell are you doing?" And then we walked past him waving. Uh, we also waved at every camera as we went by. We were pretty cocky at that point. Um, it actually took us more time to uh, read the documentation for the badge printer in the room. Um, while we were in there. It took us about three hours to figure it out. Um, so we're reading the documentation that's in the unlocked desk, of course, which uh, uh, we easily got logged into the machine with uh, the domain credentials that we had before and you know, immediately got started uh, trying to figure out how this thing worked. Just as we finish printing our badges, somebody walks in and I about shit my pants. <laughs> All I hear is just like, hey there, can I help you guys? And me and Josh froze, just stone-faced, like, oh, God, we're so busted. Like, we're definitely not supposed to be here. Um, in that time, the, uh, the employee was just like, so uh, can, can I help you with anything? Thinking quickly, Josh is like, nope, we're good. Be done in a minute. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> just literally walked away and left us in there. It's like, this is a critical critical room to your security infrastructure. You should be scared that someone you don't know is in here. Didn't think twice. Um, so we spent a lot of time having some fun uh, glossing over things briefly. We put a microphone attached to another Raspberry Pi in the conference room where the executives were. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, and we, like, we wired up Raspberry Pis all over this place, some of which we couldn't get the client to ship back to us, so we had a back door for like three years. Um, that was kind of a problem. Uh, we, we tried to tell them, like, this is where they are. Please ship those back. We need them. And they're like, ghost. Uh, and then we got caught again. Yeah. So uh, this is another area where they had a cage filled of backup tapes for their IBM data center. Um, I sat there picking that lock for about 30 minutes when a janitor walked in, looked at me, looked at the lock picks all over the floor, <laughs> and was like, I'm gonna empty this trash can, I'm gonna get the hell out of here. <laughs> he never said anything, and I think that he probably just saw us like dressed like we definitely didn't belong, like all disheveled, we hadn't slept in over 24 hours, and I'm sitting there raking this lock, and I'll suddenly, like, oh, <laughs> shit. And he's just like, nope, I don't get paid enough, I don't wanna die, <laughs> and just walked away. So after this, we, we tried to get caught. We tried to get caught, really. We decided to go hard mode on this thing and make things so difficult that we printed out these badges and started walking around with them. And we spent two more days on site and nobody noticed. Not a single person said anything. Um, ultimately, we walked away leaving our business cards and those, a copy of those badges uh, 
on the CISO's desk who is a guy with a great sense of humor, and he absolutely ripped his employees apart. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was quite a tremendous success that I'm, I'm exceptionally proud of, um, that I hope that this talk gives you some confidence to try red teaming if you're nervous about it. If you guys want to find me, Bert, uh, uh, Bert from this particular red team, you can find me at Script Nomad on Twitter or x.com, whatever it is now, uh, github.com slash uh, script dash nomad, and uh, there's my LinkedIn as well if you want to connect with me. Totally happy to do that. Uh, and there's my company's website as well. If you want to look us up and talk to us about some red teaming stuff, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to break into your office. Thank you, guys.